Well, hello there. Today we have an interesting computer. We have a machine made by Desk Station Technology, and it's called the Tyne, or the RISC PC. And as you can see here, um, it says R4600, which probably means it has a MIPS R4600 CPU in it. That was the same chip, I'm pretty sure, that was used in the Silicon Graphics Indie workstation line. Recently I was picking up some other retro computer stuff from someone and they had this computer and he said, hey, do you want to have this? And I said, absolutely, I'll take that. And yeah, here we are, I have it here. So let's take a look at this machine. So looking at the front here, uh, this machine has a three and a half inch floppy, has a CD-ROM drive, and this is the type that uses the caddies, which I guess are made by Sony or maybe NEC. Um, it did come with this uh, Keytronics keyboard and it uses an AT, standard AT style connector. Um, on the front of the computer here we just have the power button and the reset button and a hard disk LED. And he did give me a workstation NT manual, although I don't have any installation CDs. I also got the user manual with it, so that's nice. Let's take a look in here. So introducing the Tyne RISC PC. The power of a workstation with the expandability of a PC. So SVGA monitor optional. SVGA graphics card, CD-ROM, 1.4 meg floppy, SCSI hard drives, minimum 16 megs of RAM, SCSI controller card, and I.O. adapter card. Well, looking here, we have the system specifications, and just as I thought, MIPS RISC R4600 PC. Uh, it seems to run at 133 megahertz, so this is a 33 megahertz external bus. It does have cache memory, 6 meg standard RAM, expandable 256, and this just shows the front of the computer, which we've already looked at in the, in the with the physical machine. Power on lamp points to that, so that actually lights up. That's interesting. Okay. Understanding the ARCs BIOS. So ARCs, I guess, is whatever runs this uh, RISC machine here. Way back in the day, I actually used a DEC Alpha-based Windows NT workstation, but I have never actually used one, something like this before, so this is going to be really interesting to look inside of and just see if this even works. I haven't even turned it on yet. Let's take a look. Let's just take a quick break to talk about RISC processor architecture. So if we look at Wikipedia here, it's basically saying that a RISC processor is something that is more simple and less complex, and therefore can run faster. If you're not carrying all this extra silicon to run a bunch of backwards compatibility and other complex instructions, then you should be able to run the instructions you can do a lot faster. Now CISC, which is the alternative, essentially is like what an Intel processor is, and it's considered to be slower because of all the baggage, and it's less optimized. The term CISC didn't really exist before RISC processors hit the scene, as we needed a way to compare the new RISC processors with the older complex or CISC processors. Now by the time the 90s came around, RISC was really considered the future. CISC processors were essentially all the old processors you know from the 70s and the 80s, like the 6502, the Motorola 68000, and of course the Intel 8086. Microsoft, wanting to look like it was future-proofing itself, added RISC support to Windows NT in 1993 although support ended after Windows NT 4.0 when Windows 2000 came out. One thing that made CISC type processors especially useful in the 1970s and 80s was because the processor was complex, it could do more per instruction. Because of that, it made the software you were running usually smaller, and back in the 70s and 80s, we really barely had any RAM in our computers, so we needed to have code that was as small as possible. By the time the 90s came around with RISC, we had a lot more RAM in computers with computers having 16, 32, or 64 megabytes of RAM, so it wasn't such a big deal that the software actually was larger. And of course, if the processor was simpler and more optimized, then maybe it could run that larger code at a much faster speed than the old CISC Intel processors. One of the most popular CISC processors, of course, is the Intel 8086 line of processors. This was the original processor used in the very first IBM PC back in 1981, and the processor actually came out in 1978. Along the years, Intel kept upgrading this processor, adding new instructions and new modes, making it faster, adding 32 bits, making it 64 bits, and adding all sorts of other things. The very latest Core i7 processor today is still fully backwards compatible with the very first Intel 8086 processor from 1978. In the mid-90s, this was definitely considered a detriment, and that is where RISC processors were trying to capitalize on it. 
they were supposed to be fresh, new, and without all the baggage and backwards compatibility that the old Intel processor had, and consequently would be so much faster. If we look at the 1993 Intel Pentium P5, the alternatives at the time were, of course, the PowerPC 601, which was used in the Apple Power Mac line, the MIPS line of processors like the R4600 used in this Death Station Tyne and Silicon Graphics Indy, there was also the DEC Alpha from Digital Electronics Corporation used in a bunch of their computers, including the AXP150, which was a Windows NT workstation, and then of course the Spark processor line from Sun MicroStation, which was used exclusively in their Sun workstations. All of these companies were touting the fact that RISC was faster and simpler and more modern, and really just better than the Intel processors of the time. Here's an ad from Apple for the Power Mac G3. Probably came out in the later 90s because that's when the G3 version of the PowerPC was out. But if you see here, they're touting the fact that the G3 is Pentium crushing performance. Apple used a lot of dubious benchmarks to try to show off the fact that the G3 was faster than the Intel processors at the time. I mean, it really was in certain benchmarks. Apple eventually abandoned the PowerPC platform in 2006 and just migrated to the Intel line of processors anyways. Part of the reason was, of course, Intel sells a whole lot more processors than anyone else and therefore has resources to put behind making them much faster. But really, with the end of the Power Mac line of computers, that was pretty much it for the RISC processor when it came to mainstream computing. While the days of RISC-based PC workstations are long gone, you may have heard of this little company called ARM. ARM stands for Acorn RISC Machines, and the ARM2 processor was actually used in the BBC microcomputer released around 1982. It was made by the company Acorn of Acorn RISC Machine, and it was a RISC processor. And yes, this ARM architecture is still used today in all of Apple's processors in their iPhones, and all of the Snapdragon processors in all of these Android phones, and so many other devices are using ARM chips as well. While the performance benefits of RISC processing were dubious at best, one actual tangible benefit was reduced power consumption. That made it perfect for use in battery-powered mobile devices, which is where we ended up today. One funny thing is while Microsoft removed RISC support with Windows 2000, they've actually added it back into Windows 10 because there are now versions of Windows 10 that can run on ARM processors. It's hard to predict the future, but who knows? We might have PCs based on RISC architecture once again if ARM processors make it back into desktop computers. Anyway, I hope this was helpful and let's get back to the video. All right, so I've opened this up and I've kind of removed all the components so we can take a quick look at them, but the case is just a standard AT case. It uses a normal AT power supply, which is, I've removed already. Uh, this machine seems to have an IDE hard drive and a SCSI drive, and the CD-ROM drive is SCSI and it has a standard PC floppy drive. There's really nothing else interesting about this case. It's completely run of the mill. All right, so I've removed the motherboard and it's on this nice little tray. Now the funny thing is when I opened this computer, one of the SIMs was actually just floating around inside the case. It was lying between two of these uh, card slots here. I have all the memory reinstalled the computer, but one of the SIMs actually has a broken clip on it. So if you can see, normally there's a little metal lever like on this SIM, but this one here is just snapped off altogether. And that was the SIM that was fallen out. Now I use a little pick and I kind of bent what's left there into shape and it actually is holding in the SIM without an issue right now. But here looking at the motherboard, things are pretty standard fare. We have six ISA slots, but Actually, what's kind of interesting is these two connectors here are Visa Local Bus. And according to the dates on these stickers, this motherboard dates from around 1993. Visa Local Bus was a bus that was used for the 486s. It basically lets video cards and hard drive cards tie directly into the 486 processor bus. So I find it kind of strange that this computer, which is a RISC MIPS based processor, is able to interface to this. Also interesting is this computer has two Dallas Semiconductor chips here. This one is a 1287, which is the clock chip, and luckily it's in a socket because the batteries often die on these. There's actually a little bit of a mod you do where you dremel away the side of the chip and you can actually add an external battery to this. I'm not sure what this one is, this 1225AB-150, but maybe this is a, oh, it says it right on there, non-volatile SRAM. And then here's the MIPS CPU here, in a very fancy kind of gold carrier here, with, but this heatsink does look removable. I'm going to leave that on for now and give this a test and see how well this works. Inside of this computer were several cards. There was an ISA network card and this is a coax ethernet card with AUI so it has no 10 base T so this is not really usable. We have just a standard Acer PC multi IO card. Uh, looks like serial parallel along uh, with a game port, floppy drive connector and IDE. 
If you notice on the motherboard, there was no IDE or floppy controller integrated, so this multi-IO card is obviously required to do those things. Next up is a local bus S3 video card. Um, it says Actic System, so I don't know if this is a special BIOS that's designed, you know, just for this risk-based processor or not. I don't have any other PCs I can test this in to see if it works. It's a pretty run-of-the-mill S3805 video card, just VGA output, nothing much to report, and it doesn't have any extended RAM added to it. And the last card that was in here is a Bus Logic SCSI card. Um, standard SCSI output here. And look, it has actually a floppy controller on it as well. I haven't really seen that too much, but I'm not familiar with these uh, local bus SCSI cards. It does seem to support several different bus rates. This particular computer, as you saw, was a 133 processor, but the bus runs at 33 megahertz. So I guess the configuration would be 111, and it has a whole series of jumpers there for that. Nothing much to report here. The computer is quite dusty inside, so I'm going to take it outside and use my air compressor to try and get out as much dust as possible, especially from the power supply, and I'll put this thing back together. All right, so it's all back together. You know, I have all the cards remounted. Uh, funny thing is, is this was the SCSI cable that was inside this computer, um, which is very, very long. So I have actually gone into my little stash and I found a shorter cable here that just had two connectors on it. So just enough for the CD-ROM and for the SCSI drive. And then here's the IDE hard drive, which connects right here to the uh, regular ISA multi-IO. Uh, I was able to look in the manual here and see about how to connect uh, the speaker and the, the, the power LED and the jumper and stuff like that. So this isn't the best diagram because there's also a key lock connector, which actually isn't even mentioned in here at all. But there it is. And the one little thing that's uh, still kind of problematic is the CPU fan, which is a weird 5-volt fan. Uh, it doesn't always spin every time. I've cleaned it up. Um, I took it off the heat sink and I lubed the bearing. And once it's running, it seems to be fine. But when, sometimes when it tries to start, it spins a little bit and then stops. So... All right, let's see here. Makes a little bloop, chirpy sounds, kind of neat. Very noisy hard drives. All right, so there's the BIOS for the uh, video card. Testing DMA cache, calibrate timers, detecting serial ports, parallel ports, SCSI, bus logic. Shows the Western Digital hard drive, three and floppy. Chinon, CD-ROM, quantum hard drive. And then here it's asking what OS to boot. All right, OS Loader 4.0 is coming up. Windows NT 4.0, one system processor, 64 megs of RAM. I forgot to plug a serial mouse into this computer, so we're not gonna get much activity there, but I do remember how to use Windows with keyboard. I have a really junky serial mouse here. I'm going to connect this up. Probably it's going to need a reboot. Oh, look at that. There it is. NT4 with Windows <laughs> with Internet Explorer. All right, so I'm not going to know the login. Try a few things. Password. So it's not blank. It's not password, uh, administrator, password, is there anything written on the front of this thing? Tyne, T-Y-N-E, well I guess I'm going to have to find something that can override this password. Alright, so since I can't log into the Windows NT that's installed on here, um, I found a copy of Windows NT Workstation that I had. Uh, it's a burned copy, but I seem to have the original box here, so it means that um, I have the CD key here. Um, I don't know if the CD-ROM even works, and I did a little uh, googling, and basically to you go into setup here, and to do booting, you have to say run a program, and you run, and you put the path of the CD-ROM, and it's MIPS slash setup loader. So uh, let's give this a try, see what happens. All right, so the, C the disk is in, so we go to enter setup, and down here it shows the path of CD-ROM, so we say run a program. So I assume it's SCSI zero CD-ROM. I'm typing wrong, zero, f-disk, disk, 
Zero backslash MIPS backslash setup da LDR. Enter. Okay, that light's going. Oh, look at that. Windows NT setup. Okay, great. So I guess I'll just reinstall Windows on top of what's on here now, or maybe I'll install it onto the IDE driver. I'm not too sure. And we'll go from there. Well, that's neat. So here's Windows NT's auto detection here. Desk station technology tying. So it's seeing the computer. S3 based uh, video and keyboard, serial mouse. So interesting. And it detected the bus logic card as well right off the bat. So I hit a minor roadblock. I want to install Windows onto the IDE hard drive because currently it's booting off the 500 megabyte SCSI drive. It's a quantum. So um, I was looking to just pick the other drive, which is the C drive. I'm making quotes, C drive. Uh, but it's saying here that it can't do it because you have to use a manufacturer supply program. Well, I don't have that. But it does say that you can find the ARC inst application on the Windows CD-ROM. So I'm going to have to do this run a program thing again, and I'm, I'll find the ARC inst.exe, and I will run that, and we'll see about partitioning the IDE drive. Okay, so I'm going to run the ARC inst off the CD-ROM. It's in the MIPS directory here, so if I just put the path in here, and hit enter, and there it is, ARC installation program, version 4, configure partitions. So I just want to make an existing partition, so there's the SCSI, and there's the uh, IDE disk. Partition 1, 3,000 megabytes. Oh, it's already a system partition. Well, it's because I just did that a minute ago. But I wanted to show you how it looked. You hit Enter, Exit, Exit, Turn to Arc BIOS. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to say Run a Program Again. And down at the bottom here, you see the path. So we're going to boot the... And you hear the CD-ROM kind of doing its thing. And Windows NT setup loads. Okay, now after doing ARC inst, it does see the fat hard drive as something I can do a boot off. And um, let's do it there. IDE slash SD disk. That's pretty funny. Uh, you've chosen to install a fresh copy of Windows. System blah, blah, blah. Use this operating system. Your computer requires system partition formatted with a fat file system. Oh, that sucks. Okay, I think I'm going to put a new hard drive in here. I don't feel like erasing this drive. I forgot how Windows NT requires you to format the hard drive to do the original setup. I think it's because it needs a little tiny system partition that's fat that starts the NT loader and then it can switch over to NTFS. Okay, so I've set up Windows on another hard drive here and it's all installed. I had to create a partition as I showed with that Arc Inst tool, so I just created a system partition. Uh, this one does not have any admin password. Time and date is invalid. So the battery must be already shot. Let's take a look. Yep. <laughs> the date is 1601. So clearly the battery is bad on that uh, real-time clock, so I'm going to have to fix that. So here we are, Windows. Uh, let's check out the C drive. So this is the one I just set up. So we got WinNT here. So. These are the partitions on the other hard drive, the, the SCSI drive. Okay, so even though the hard drive I have in here is a 40 gig, it's only seen as an 8 gig, but that's fine. So let's create a partition on this drive, and we'll make an NTFS partition. Looks like this computer has Lightwave 3D on it, Lightwave 4.0 from NewTek. Kind of makes sense. The guy I got this from, he used to do video production and video editing and using uh, video toasters and Amiga stuff back in the day. So he probably used this to do rendering because it's much faster than the Amiga would be. But unfortunately, um, when I try to run these, this gives me an error. Yeah, startup failure, 212 hardware key not found. That's the modeler if I try to run that. And if I try to run Lightwave itself, I just get this strange error, $001. Now, I have not installed these myself because I don't have the installation media and I copied them off the SCSI hard drive because that's the boot volume that, you know, I'm not able to log into. But I think I config, you know, copied all the configuration files over properly and it doesn't seem to be working. Knowing the person I got this from, he would have had legitimate copies of this software. So he had the, the key. If you're not familiar with the key is, it's a little hardware dongle that would plug into the back of the computer, say a parallel or serial port dongle, and then the software as you run it would authenticate against the dongle, it's sort of a hardware key, so you couldn't just copy the software. There's typically no copy protection on the computer itself other than the little hardware dongle. 
Otherwise, on this computer, there really wasn't anything else on here. I copied everything off the SCSI drive, and the E drive was the larger of the partitions, and it basically just contains the new tech Lightwave stuff. Uh, it looks like it also has a copy of QuickBooks. Um, but other than that, uh, there's not much going on on this computer. It's just basically a vanilla install of Windows NT 4.0, which is what I've just reinstalled. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. I think what I'm going to do, since Lightwave doesn't work, I made a backup copy of the files onto this hard drive, so I'm just going to erase the SCSI drive and reinstall Windows NT 4.0 from scratch on there. And that will be the sort of play drive to use this computer if I you know, want to run some MIPS software that runs on NT. But I'm going to have to do some research to see what I can find, see if I can even find any. All right, I'm just replacing the CPU fan. So this was the original one. It was a 5-volt fan, and it plugged into the motherboard. But testing on the bench power supply, it just didn't start reliably at 5 volts. It started maybe half the time. If I put 5.5 volts into it, it started every time. Um, I did take it apart by taking the retaining clip off and I've removed the fan and the bearing is actually in good shape. So I'm really not sure what's wrong with this. It might electrically be inferior. But as you can see, it's a much smaller fan than this 12 volt fan I put on here. And I've attached it to 12 volts, which is what this fan runs on. Okay, so let's take a look at this computer in its final configuration. I have the three gigabyte IDE Caviar drive in here. It seems to be the only thing that really works. I tried to use a compact flash to IDE adapter, but the computer only saw it as 63 megabytes and it was a four gig card, so that didn't work. So I stuck with this old junky drive. I took the SCSI drive out because I could use that into other things. It's a 500 meg drive. It might work better in an Amiga or something like that. So I took that out. It has the SCSI CD-ROM drive. It has the three and a half inch floppy. And I tried to kind of clean up the wires as best as possible. I have replaced the fan in the front of the computer. Down in here, there's a front fan, and it was just caked with dirt and horrible, so I put a new one in there. Windows NT4 is freshly installed, so if I control delete, no password currently on here. Here's how I have the drive configured. The C drive has a gigabyte, and the rest of the three gigabytes is on the E partition, which is NTFS. So there's the Tyne by Desk Station Technology. It's a bit of an oddball machine, but it's pretty cool nonetheless. I've never really had my hands on a MIPS Windows NT machine before. I looked around looking for some software I could run on here, and I did find some old websites with some cross-compiled tools and other software, but almost all the links were dead, and I wasn't really able to find anything. The MIPS version of Windows NT can run Windows 32 applications, but it does it with an emulation layer, and it's just not very fast, so if you have any suggestions of operating systems or other software I can run on Windows here on this machine, uh, please put them in the comment section below and I'll definitely give it a try. I do have some other Intel machines of the same era, so it'll be interesting to do some benchmarks on this machine and compare them to the benchmarks on the other machines. I just need to find a benchmark that can run on both. Anyways, um, if you found this useful or interesting at all, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. You can subscribe for more videos, and I appreciate you watching. Have a good night. Bye.